Hey everyone, I'm Kevin Gastola, managing editor for Shadowproof and the curator of the Dissenter. I want to thank you for waiting as uh, we're getting everything set over here on our end. We're ready to go, and I'm going to bring in both of the wonderful guests that we have. I'm just going to uh, do this, and uh, th there they are. So uh, we've got Kelly Tranter, who is an attorney in Australia and a human rights activist who's been doing work on the Assange case. And then we've got Kit Clarenberg, who is here, and he is joining us and uh, did this article, really good, fantastic report on documents that were obtained by Kelly on the Assange case from the perspective of the, Assa uh, of the Australian government, of um, looking at what the Australian government's role has been in this case and their complicity in the continued suffering and detention of Assange. So thank you both for joining us. Uh, we talk about this important aspect of this, this saga, really, that stretches back to 2010. Um, so to begin, uh, you know, I, I think uh, we're, we wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for the article you put together, Kit. So why don't you maybe perhaps begin um, telling people about, you know, these documents, uh, putting the story together, uh, what what you saw, why you wanted to piece this together and, and share this with people. And then we'll get into uh, some of the more specific aspects of this. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think first, I think like we wouldn't be doing this at all if it wasn't for Kelly's crusading work. So I think absolutely, she that's an true. Enormous, yes. yeah. an enormous like degree of degree of credit for unearthing and for fighting over so many years to unearth this stuff. I mean, I think that the I decided to focus on the files related to the Australian consular visit to uh, uh, Julian in in, in Belmarsh, uh, which were so generously supplied to me by Kelly, because to my mind, the, they're, they're kind of like a Rosetta Stone of, of sorts. So like, you know, everything that we learned from the extradition ruling about, you know, the, about how Julian has suffered so horrifically in Belmarsh was spelled out right there and then. In a, in, a, in a visit in May uh, 2019, like you know, less than a month after he'd been, you know, rather aggressively uh, expelled from the embassy, uh, and so you know, you know, he, here we are, almost two years later, um, and then this is, you know, it, it's amazing considering that, that, that this meeting lasted less than an hour, um, and I'll also say as a preface that this was actually, you know, really rather difficult to write about because you know the scale of the torment and the, the psychological and physical abuse. The conditions of Belmarsh, which is you know, rightly known as Britain's Gitmo, uh, by necessity imposed upon Julian, are utterly inconceivable and just uh, so egregious. But anyway, um, you know, at, you know, at this at this point, you know, Julian was subject to a twenty-three hour a day solitary confinement, and he told you know his uh, uh, embassy visitors that he spent most of his day in his cell with just you know forty minutes allocated each day for associations, uh, and then you know he was allowed outside for thirty minutes a day uh, each day. But that you know this doesn't. This didn't always happen. Um, and, you know, they, he, he had two personal visits each month plus legal consultations. Uh, at this point, he just met with Nils Melzer, who, you know, uh, about a month later issued an you know, incredibly fiery, incendiary uh, condemnation of the kind of uh, conditions that he was exposed to. Uh, and, and, you know, there's just there are so many things that jump out. And, you know, one of the things that you know, many people have highlighted here. Is it's just that is um, how he was told that he'd uh, been diagnosed uh, with HIV or, you know, after undergoing blood tests, uh, you know, which is obviously you know, absolutely shocking. And then subsequent examinations confirmed the test result to be a false positive. And if you actually look at data on um, HIV tests, they're very rarely wrong. But you know, which tends to suggest that this wasn't an error and this was you know a grotesquely sick mind game. Um, you know, alluding alluding to the false sexual assault allegations he faced in Sweden, which was just intended to drive him, you know, you know, you know, even deeper into the kind of mental pit <laughs> which he was inhabiting. I mean, it's it's really it's really extraordinary, and I think that I mean, I I I, I I'd be interested to know Kelly's take on uh, like on you know, on this particular aspect of the file. Yeah, let's hear from you, Kelly. Yeah, look, I, I suppose I should start by um, saying thank you. Kevin and thank you, Kit. Um, I've had um, 
Assange's uh, legal authority to obtain documents on his behalf since about November, but obviously I was slogging away before that to obtain information about this case. And um, that came about because um, the costs associated with issuing these FOIs uh, were prohibitive. Uh, and of course, there's a provision uh, in Australia uh, that provides for people to, to obtain in, uh, in personal information about themselves free of charge. Uh, and of course, that authority was facilitated in very difficult circumstances with Assange being in prison uh, by his father. But the story of, of complicity uh, of consecutive Australian governments is, is largely untold. You know, the Australian government has uh, escaped international uh, criticism by and large, and, um, and yet it, it really does have the capacity to end suffering for Assange and, and his family. And the official line from the, the consecutive Australian governments since, you know, 2012 really um, has been that they can't intervene uh, in legal proceedings of other countries. Uh, they've provided consular assistance and, of course, they say Assange withdrew consent to obtain uh, information about uh, his health and well-being. That was written information, of course. It doesn't stop them from visiting him and they certainly have made contact with Belmarsh since that, that uh, authority was withdrawn. They've said, of course, that Assange is entitled to due process, humane and fair treatment, as well as um, medical and legal assistance. Um, and, and importantly, they've said in the event that he were to stand trial in the US, uh, he would be subject to the procedural fairness and due process enshrined in the US Constitution and under US law. Um, so they've, you know, you know, they've basically taken the position for a very long time that they've got utter faith in the UK system and the US system and... Um, historically, the, the Swedish system. And uh, of course, over a decade, that hasn't been contested um, because, you know, uh, Assange has been in the embassy, he's continued with his work, um, and, you know, they've, they've largely been out of it. But of course, that's started to unravel uh, the, you know, the minute really Assange was carted out of the, the embassy. I mean, and I, I mean, I, I mean, I would say um, that just, I mean, in, in in terms of complicity, like you know, Canberra has, I mean, it, uh, it, in response to Nils Melzer's uh, statement about the how you know, you know Julian was was subject to you know absolutely egregious levels of torture, you know, they were very quick to say that you know we are a staunch defender of human rights and a strong advocate for yeah. humane treat, treatment, but then like just sheerly by token of remaining so silent when there is so much that they could have said at any point publicly, There's so many key points that they were they were possessed of so much information attesting to the fact that he was yeah, again by by, by token of being in in uh, Belmarsh was you know, was being mistreated. Yeah, they are heavily complicit. You know, there's that hackneyed adage, which is you know the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for, for good men to do nothing. You know, I'm not sure the Australian government um, is in any way comprised of good men or women in any event. But they, you know, they, they, you know, they're captured by U.S. and British interests, and their agenda is drawn up and dictated by London and Washington. But you know, but do nothing they certainly have, and it's inconceivable that if this had been any other Australian citizen being tortured to death for any crime, let alone the crime of journalism, anywhere else in the world, particularly in you know, a designated enemy state like China or Iran or Russia, that this would be the case. They would be working flat out, particularly if they possess knowledge of the kind, kind of conditions in which that individual was you know, subject to. Um, and, you know, which they did in this instance in the most visceral fashion. And you look at, say, for instance, David Hicks, who was incarcerated in you know, the actual Guantanamo Bay and brutally tortured because he was involved with jihadist elements in various countries. Uh, you know, the facts of the, 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 you know, that case are in serious dispute, but, you know, we don't know precisely what he did, why and when. But, you know, he did write to his parents boasting of having met Osama bin Laden and attending terrorist training camps and being involved in a shooting war uh, against India and claimed he was well trained for jihad. And then Canberra seems to have worked really hard to get him out of there. Um, you know, like, you know, and, you know, Julian has committed no crime. He is an innocent person. The, the, the only indictment that has any, any kind of procedural weight to it was influenced, and I'll never get tired of reminding people of this, by the avowedly false testimony of a convicted fraudster and paedophile and diagnosed sociopath. Like, you know, it, 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 it is absolutely unbelievable that if this, as I say, had been any other Australian citizen in any other context, that they would, that Canberra would not be, you know, banging on doors and making extreme, you know, lots of noises, uh, you know, about uh, uh, about their, their citizens' treatment, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So it, it seems like a pivotal moment here that is covered in the documents that you were able to obtain, uh, Kelly, is the, the, the visit by the consulate officials in May of 2019, which seems to really set the tone for the kind of interest or the lack of, of compassion or care that the Australian government was going to show to Julian while he is in Belmarsh. Um, I'd like to have both of you uh, discuss some of the details that were in documents about this particular visit. We've already, I, I believe this is the same um, visit where the, the HIV test is brought up, but there are other aspects of it. Uh, we'll start with you, Kelly, and then you know, Kit, you can add whatever you want, but it seems like this consulate sure. visit is important. And then maybe you can speak about uh, w whether there were other visits after this that are you know, as significant. Sure. Um, I will just say though, um, Kit, the day, in the David Hicks case, um, he, th there was a, a enormous political pressure in the end. Uh, I think most Australians had had enough of his mistreatment. Um, mm. More information came to light, and of course, um, there was a federal election, so it forced the hand of the government to to take action mm. in that case. And fortuitously, in the Assange case, there's a federal election uh, mm. in the first half of of next year. Um, in relation to um, the visits in May, you know they. Um, DFAT officials had really be, been um, since May um, of 2019 documenting in their own way the, the deterioration of Assange. Um, the chronology I prepared, which is available for your audience, Kevin, um, really gives uh, details of a, a diminished man. Um, you know, the DFAT officials were, were well and truly aware of the weight loss, the lack of appetite. Um, they were aware of um, Assange's fears of being extradited to the United States. They they obviously knew that he was in a difficult position inside prison um, because, you know, you can't rock the boat. You know, it's, it's a different world. Things are beyond your control. Um, so, um, you know, he he really put a, uh, the chocks on, on DFAT officials raising things with prison authorities um, with good reason. He had to, he's got to survive in there, you know. Uh, he... Um, uh, but even even before they started to visit um, Assange in prison, you know, he, he had told DFAT officials that um, diplomatic assistance uh, was necessary. He had warned them that there was CIA involvement uh, in his case. Um, and DFAT officials, instead of actioning uh, with, um, this sort of information or uh, causing internal alarm, uh, they they just appear to you know uh, you know document it and that and that's as far as it goes um, mm. and that's where the the complicity and the silence um, mm. is so distressing uh, for those who follow this case closely and, and those who who are uh, concerned about um, Assange and of course why it's so distressing for the family and of course the lawyers have to be really careful when they deal with the Australian government because you know, they have to be careful of where uh, loyalties lie because we have such a um, close relationship with the United States. We share information with the United States. So everything's quite guarded. Um, but there's just the, it's just the tragedy of, of DFAT officials and observers sitting in that courtroom observing um, Assange being unable to state his name and date of mm. birth um, when they're sitting on information of, of a man who, who really does fear for his life if he's extradited. Um, and, and it's, it's, but this, what is so for, uh, fortunate about this information that we've been able to obtain uh, is that obviously because we have an authority uh, from Assange himself, they can't redact a lot of the information that they otherwise would. Uh -huh. um, so that is why it's starting to, to un unravel for the Australian government because people see um, a, a man that's a shadow of his former self. They see that, um, you know, his family's distressed. They're hearing from the family that the Australian government could, could end it with a phone call. Uh, they've mm -hmm. seen other actions taken in the case of um, uh, Kylie Moore Gilbert, uh, who was detained mm -hmm. in Iran, uh, Peter Grist, uh, who was detained in Egypt, uh, which is a country we didn't have any political leverage with. 
um, but but they pulled out all the stocks to to get the rep- mm. uh, you know to work towards the repatriation of those two Australian citizens. So they Australians don't no longer buy uh, this excuse that um, you know we're not involved, we can't intervene. They can see mm. it's politically motivated, um, and mm. you know, uh, let's hope that 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 uh, there is some weight placed. Uh, on that as we approach a federal election in this country. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I just, I just, I found it really striking that the, 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 the contrast between uh, DFAT's uh, co- uh, official statement on, <clears throat> on, on, uh, on the extradition ruling in January versus the, you know, opposition Labour Party. And, and you know, I mean, the, the opposition Labour Party you know, hardly went in, the, but they did still forcefully say, you know, this has dragged on long enough. Uh, particularly given Julian's ill health and the, the Morrison administration, you know, need to you know do, do needs to do what it can to draw a line under this matter and encourage Washington to bring this matter to a close. But then you know, D, you know, DFAT just say just say just say, oh well, Australia is not a party to this case and will continue to respect the ongoing legal process. I mean, it's just it's 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 really extraordinary, actually. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Kit, well, you're right, Uh, and um, the principles can't be reconciled with, um, you know, when when the Australian government refers to due process, of Mm. course, the ordinary observer, independent observer says, okay, um, well, why is there silence um, with regard to the First Amendment not applying to foreign nationals, you know, if, Mm. if... you know, there's going to be a distinction being made between foreign nationals and American citizens if the case goes ahead in the United States. Australians see the confiscation of, uh, of legal papers. He's, um, you know, he's legally privileged uh, conversations being recorded mm-hmm. um, and siphoned back to, to the United States. Um, he, his deprivation uh, of access or being deprived of access to his lawyers, appropriate um uh, an appropriate computer that's working so that he can prepare his case, the excessive mm. strip searching, the being placed in a hot box. Um, every communication that he has is either recorded or is, and indeed his, the documents reveal that his mail is opened uh, on a regular mm. basis. Um, the absurdity of saying we've offered consular assistance time and time again, um, which requires him to, to sign a written authority and return it to them. Um, when he may or may not have access to a writing implement, you know. Um, and then we've got the silence of um, the, the CIA revelations, the silence on, uh, even before that, uh, UN reports saying that he's been mistreat, mistreated um, and our government obtaining legal advice about that, but remaining <laughs> remaining silence, inaction. Mm. They've just let it roll Roll on, and and on top of that, the documenting of his physical decline, uh, and the acknowledgement, indeed, by the foreign minister that um, she's read um, parts of the judgment. Obviously, obviously, she cannot say which parts she has read because that implicates her in having knowledge of the extent of his physical decline, which was, you know, really detailed in that in that judgment. So, you know, and and of course that talks about him hiding under his bed, banging his head against the wall. Um, the, you know, the, they're sitting on information where he showed them the charge sheet of having a razor blade mm. uh, in his cell. Uh, you know, they, they might, ch- might try and claim that they're not doctors and they can't make that assessment. But look, mm. you know, in the context of all the information, um, the, the alarm bells should have been going off with inside DFAT. And I think for too long, we've had this predetermined position uh, taken by DFAT officials, by ministers. And I think a decision was made very early on, and in fact, in, in 2012, that um, there is a, there, this case raises sort of strategic implications for the US-Australian uh, alliance. And, you know, it's been mm-hmm. hands off. You know, we'll document it, we'll be kept involved. Um, and, and um, you know, and that's why no action has been taken for over a decade. Mm-hmm. I want to call people's attention to uh, your your chronology that you do, Kelly, at your site, uh, which is very valuable if people want to dig into the details um, and and know specific, more specific examples related to what you're discussing. Um, and then 
you know, the the other thing I want to ask is is in the in the timeline of events of uh, you were you're referring to some specific instances during his time while he's been in Belmarsh that the Australian officials could have spoken up for his well-being. Uh, can you speak to the fact that you know he goes into the sick bay at Belmarsh, and that's that's a critical moment where his mm -hmm. government could speak up uh, about his welfare and and yeah. and engage Belmarsh and, and make certain that something's being done, or maybe even push for him to be released from jail so that he can be on on mm -hmm. at least minimum at minimum home confinement while awaiting these hearings, uh, but they do not. I'm, I'm sorry, go on, go on, Kelly, go on. No, 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 Kate, you, you go ahead. No, well, no, I was just going to say that, like, I mean, it was something that really jumped out to me from the files that you provided, is that, like, on, you know, on, on, you know, on, on May 30th, 2019, um, when Julian's been in prison for over a month at, uh, at, at that point, um, you know, like, WikiLeaks announced on Twitter that Julie, uh, Julian had been moved to Belmarsh's medical ward and you know, express grave concern at this as you know as, as well they might um and then you know we see from the files that almost immediately dfat uh fire off an internal email drawing attention to this post um and then it's the next day that nils melzer um you know calls for the the, the immediate end of the collective persecution of julian but then like it, uh you know dfat repeatedly attempt to get in touch with belmarsh via you know phone and via mail um, and and you know, for six days they, they they received no response. And you would think that again, in in the case of any other Australian citizen who is subject to this in a foreign prison, that that you know the Australian High Commissioner would intervene and you know demand immediate answers on what is literally a life and death matter of urgency. But this didn't happen. Um, it's you know it, again, it's really extraordinary. Um, it, 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 it's it's kind of unbelievable actually. Uh, like really, and and uh, you know, again, and then you know, th their only response to this is to is to claim that they're not complicit in any a, a, in, in any torture of Julian, and all that they they are you know uh, guilty of a lack of consular support for him. Sure, and I, I think the other interesting thing is that DFAT officials visited Assange uh, the day before he was moved to uh, the health unit in mm -hmm. Belmarsh. Uh, and mm -hmm. at, at, it was throughout that visit that um, Assange detailed, um, or they, they observed and documented his weight loss and his inability to eat. Uh, and he also expressed his concerns about uh, extradition to the United States. Um, and that was nine days after um, the UN Special Rapporteur had actually visited uh, Assange in Belmarsh with uh, medical experts who uh, were convinced that he uh, had been tortured. They ran the Istanbul, Istanbul uh, protocol, which, um, you know, and, and they uh, they positively uh, identified that he'd been tortured. And of course, Nils Melzer uh, had a shot uh, at the Australian government about their complicity mm. by inaction. And of course, yeah. DFAT uh, issued a statement that they, they took offence and issued a, an immediate um, statement saying that you know the UN special rapporteur had not raised anything directly with them you know it's all a word game directly indirectly um so um they were on notice and their files show that they've got a very detailed report from, from Neil Melzer um describing that torture uh they saw him indeed the day before he was moved to the health ward um and the other thing is there is a, a visit late in the year you know I think it was around about the first of November 2019 uh, and if you look at the judgment um, he was in a very, very bad way. He was on his knees at that time. Um, they wanted to go and visit him to um, soon after I received the authority to act on his behalf in FOIs to explain the consequences of that authority, uh, and that was politely uh, declined because Assange is in a situation where you only get so many visits and he wants to reserve that for either his lawyers or his family, and he felt that that, that visit would be excessive. So... They, that that uh, authority drew them out uh, to be able to go and visit him. But, of course, um, they've relied on the sending of letters to, to both his lawyers and to Assange in prison to escape uh, or, or for the appearance that they're, they're being proactive in his case. The minister did uh, concede that um, consular support and diplomatic 
support are very different and both imp both important. But um, what is so frustrating is that in, uh, at the end of October, the foreign minister said to a uh, Senate estimates hearing that she's she has done all that she is able to, which is a very disingenuous statement. It could mean anything, only she knows what it means. Uh, but it, if you look at that in the context of the information over over a, a decade long period, uh, it to me suggests that she's she's sort of done everything that she's permitted to do. You know, she, she, she feels that she is not in a position to act diplomatically in this case, even though there is enormous political leverage for our government with the United States to say, look, this has gone on too long. He was, you know, there was never any murmuring from the beginning, no political statements underpinning anything relating to Assange that he was entitled to the presumption of innocence ever. Mm -hmm. uh, and that independent observers can't see that he's done anything wrong. Our government has not um, been prepared to even go that far. Um, so now, instead of saying, "Look, we know you want to make a, we know we recognise this is a political case, we recognise you want to make an example of him," but enough's enough. Um, our our government's not prepared to to take that step, uh, and uh, you know that can only have something to do with with the alliance. Uh, and in fact, there is a, a cable from 2012 that talks about. Assange and the, the a snapshot of um, the alliance with the United States in the context of his case. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put a uh, part of Kit's uh, excellent report at the gray zone up on the screen and, and ask about uh, this uh, document from this eternal email from April 5th, 2019 um, sure. that says, uh, <clears throat> basically that uh, FYI Assange might be evicted not sure if his lawyers will make any um, not very convincing and that was put in italics for the article to call attention to it but say not very convincing arguments about Australia's responsibilities to him but thought it was worth flagging um, which uh, is basically an indication as as you can point out that they really don't think there's anything there for his attorneys to to say um, that could help him avoid extradition to the United States by, I suppose, invoking his his citizenship as an Australian or um, talking about things that uh, the I imagine the government could be doing for him to to take care of his well being. So I was just curious if you would like to add anything to. Um, what seems like a significant show, again, like this is another aspect of pointing out that they uh, are, are not good faith people who are on the side of Assad, that they're not that they're not really there to help. I mean, I think I mean, I think it, it shows very clearly that, like, you know, even before he was sprung from the embassy, like, you know, they clearly didn't care. Uh, they weren't concerned at all about his well-being or what was going to happen and they, they'd already resolved to do absolutely nothing but the, i mean i think that like in the, the wider context of that is really interesting so it's like uh, the um this wasn't something that featured in my article but it's something that, that uh, kelly's drawn attention to on 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 twitter is that there, there are some very interesting gaps in the consular files um you know, it, you know on on the first of june of uh, 2017, so this is six weeks after you know then CIA Director Mike Pompeo designated WikiLeaks a, a non-state hostile uh, intelligence service uh, because the CIA had no evidence that, that the organization had collaborated with Russia. Um, you know, a classified cable of some kind is sent to the Australian High Commission in London. Uh, you know, we don't know precisely what that consisted of, but it's marked, you know, contact with post, so it's an official communique. Um, and, you know, the very next day, you know, a letter t uh, titled Julian Assange.pdf was sent by an individual named Ashley Vagoda, uh, at that time, uh, uh, International Operations Liaison Officer at the Embassy. Um, and recipients could have included the police or legal representation or a funeral home, strikingly. And the content of the letter was fully redacted when Kelly received it. And this is right around the time that, you know, as Yahoo News exposed and uh, uh, Grey Zone editor Max Blumenthal has exposed, that there were plans to, you know, kidnap or kill Julian, <laughs> you know, coming out of the embassy. So, <clears throat> the, the, you know, in, in diplomatic terms, 
yeah, you know, the liaison officers, you know, of which uh, the, the aforementioned Ashley Goder is, uh, you know, is one. Uh, they're representatives of a country security and all, you know, intelligence service, you know, who are posted abroad to deal with issues that kind of impact on their homeland, you know, and serve as a key point of contact between their diplomatic mission and their home government. Um, so, say, you know, an FBI or CIA operative posted to the embassy in that role would, would you know, would, would coordinate with MI5 or the National Security, uh, sorry, the National Crime Agency on areas of interest to Washington. And, you know, come uh, February 2019, uh, which is, you know, not long before uh, Julian is, is sprung out of the embassy and, you know, not long before that, the the, the, uh, the message to which you were very sent, uh, the Goda has moved to a dedicated police liaison position. Um, you know, now I've done some digging into him, and he, he's an expert in, in cybercrime. You know, a specialist who who you know monitors, infiltrates, and you know breaks up online net networks of hackers. So you know, he could well have been keeping an eye on the, the wider WikiLeaks network. Uh, you know, we know that U.S. intelligence was focused on going after Julian's confed you know confederates, quote unquote, using the same tools they used to you know again, quote unquote, now de deconstruct WikiLeaks. Uh, as, uh, uh, that they used to dismantle and track Al Qaeda, and so if someone's going to be in the loop on that kind of uh, that kind of plot, but then also is also is going to be in the loop on you know a you know a police plan to arrest Julian and drag him from the embassy, it's this individual. Um, yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's a gap in our understanding. All we can do is speculate, but it's still very interesting, um, and I would suggest that you know there's. Uh, uh, the, the, the fact that it was fully redacted uh, tends to speak volumes about what's actually contained in it. Yeah, and, and I'm pleased, Kevin, that you raised uh, that um, email from the Attorney General's Department that was contained within um, mm. FOI material. Um, it was dated the 5th of April uh, 2019, so it's just before Assange um, mm. was evicted. Um, literally. A week, a literal week, a literal yeah, week. Correct. But the, but the interesting story about that particular email is that when I originally received the, the documents from the Attorney General's Department, the words not very convincing in that sentence had been redacted on the basis that uh, it was a provision of legal advice. Uh, and, of course, I had to appeal that. Um, and I appealed that firstly internally within the Attorney General's Department and they came back with the unredacted version, which... Um, you know, when you look at, at the, the sentence it's in, in its entirety, it suggests, um, you know, a, a predetermined position. So even before hearing from the lawyers for uh, Assange, it, to their mind, you know, there's nothing they can do uh, to, to assist him. Um, and it's embarrassing, you know, which is why they uh, redacted those words. I mean, I haven't seen any legal advice provided that is three words. <laughs> In, 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 in um, certainly in my time, but you know, um, so that that's interesting in and of itself. In relation to the CIA re revelations, um, we know that the foreign minister and the prime minister of the day have both suggested that the first they heard about um, the plot to either kidnap or assassinate Assange um, was when they read about it uh, in the news, even though Assange had 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 really given them some indications of CIA involvement back in mm. 2019 or even earlier, I think. Um, don't quote me on the dates. Um, so um, the, the foreign minister was questioned about what steps have been taken um, since um, finding out about these revelations. And of course, um, she took that question on notice. Um, she said she read about it. She, she couldn't remember if she raised it with her staff or her staff raised it with her, um, but she, she took the question on notice. Um, and, um, you know, the, it, and, and silence has ensued, you know. It's, it's, um, and the difficulty in Australia is that it's not something you can FOI. You can't FOI the intelligence agencies uh, mm -hmm. to find out what knowledge they had, you know, it, it's that they're completely uh, carved out of... of FOI laws in this country, um, mm. so it is. You just you do have to speculate, um, unless you know uh, somebody comes forward that that has concrete information. But um, it's entirely unacceptable. And Jen Robinson, Assange's lawyer, said as much. She, you know, she said, "What what will the Australian government do um, about this?" And it's not the first time the Australian government has been on notice 
because um, ABC, uh, the Australian Bro Broadcasting Corporation um, in uh, this country, detailed the, the recordings of uh, Assange with his Australian lawyers and his Australian doctor or, or doctors um, and Australian visitors. And of course, that aired by, uh, by a very senior experienced journalist, Dylan Welsh. Um, and uh, it was alleged at that time that, the, that those recordings were being shipped up to the CIA. Um, and again, there were nothing said. But of course, when a family member contacted uh, DFAT uh, directly about her concerns uh, about uh, the revelations that of this plot, to, to actually kidnap or assassinate uh, Assange. Um, she was told that, you know, you can't believe everything you read in the press uh, and, a, and mm -hmm. the CIA has been accused of a lot of things, including sort of faking the moon landing. So it was quite dismissive. <laughs> so that dismissiveness, it, it seemed, it's a cultural, internal cultural position taken, whether it's the not very convincing argument uh, in relation to Assange, um, those, those comments to the dismissing of the family member uh, it's the fact that the family members have to chase DFAT for information. Um, you know, the family members get um, the reports from the observers who go to the courtroom, um, but, but not much else. Uh, so it's a very passive position publicly, um, but yet there is so much redacted material over, uh, over a 10-year period. It shows that, that um, the Australian government is anything but... Uh, uninvolved. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'll put uh, another uh, document that I thought was really um, important to, uh, you know, understanding what's been going on with the Australian government. Um, and this was the deport. The, the, so there was this deportation notice. And I know this probably has more to do with the British government, but um, the fact of the matter is that he would be deported to Australia. And so this 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 was uh, something that was obtained with your uh, through your freedom of information requests. Um, of course, it also, again, this points to another issue that has been very real in this case, which was the the seizure, the the, the stolen materials that were taken from him that there were these artworks, there's manuscripts of two books, there's legal papers that were taken. Um, this is all documented. I think what's good about this file here is that it actually matches what Gareth Pierce told the district court in the extradition case. Um, and so that's something for people to keep in mind, not that I, you know, anyone here is skeptical and believing that um, attorneys for Julian are, are, are lying or anything, but it just says that like, What's reflected in these documents also lines up with what we're hearing from the legal team as they make their claims in court. So that's that's definitely good, right? To, well, uh, and, and, the, and yeah. the other thing, Kevin, is that um, what it, what is I suppose missing from the conversation is that it completely undermines any hope for a fair trial mm. um, because the unlawful conduct. Um, of the United States has really deprived him of the documents and deprived him of a fair opportunity to work with his lawyers in the preparation of his defence. Um, and yet our Australian government has insisted for for well over 10 years that, um, you know, he's entitled to due process, um, procedural fairness. Uh, and yet this is a difficult, ideologically, um, it's, it's a difficult position for them to defend against you know and that's why there is silence because what can the government say of course it's outrageous uh, and unacceptable and things should have been said but all australians are told is look we've raised it with our uk counterpart or we've raised it with our, our us counterpart uh, and sought assurances but they totally redact um the information related to those conversations now um, some may say, well, that's fair enough. But uh, if I, uh, I personally have issued FOIs on other government departments and at least talking points uh, and briefing papers are provided in, in fairly unredacted form, which gives you a, a broad understanding of what they propose to raise um, with counterparts on their sort of international visits. Um, so documents do exist, we know, um, and um, they've not yet been produced. And, and, and it's just 
I mean, it's just absurd um, that you have a situation <laughs> where the foreign minister in Australia raised at some point the case of Assange with Mike Pompeo, <laughs> who mm. is very central to the Yahoo article uh, about, um, you know, the CIA involvement. Uh, so, you know, the Australian government's going to Pompeo and saying, you know, seeking assurances uh, when you've got all of that going on in the background. I mean, it's just absurd. Uh, and, of course, that's why um, uh, anyone with a semblance of understanding of mo modern history and America's involvement in modern history, you know, no longer, no longer accept it. No longer, no longer accept the excuses or buy that this is anything other than political. So let's you know just take a moment to get into the part that has received some attention. But I think let's talk about it in the context of what we know from these uh, these files. These you know the fact that we've got this you know um, you know we've got this uh, understanding now that the. Australian government is totally hostile and, and not very considerate of the interests of, of Julian Assange. And I will pair that with the fact that the um, Br both the British government and the US government are leading people to believe that Assange should accept that they're going to take care of him if he's in their custody and allow for a prisoner transfer if he were to be put on trial and then found guilty. Um, in the United States, so that would absolve the United States of, of any responsibility um, for, you know, any any concerns related to the U.S. prison system. That would be taken care of because, simply put, he's going to apply for a prisoner transfer to Australia uh, based upon um, uh, is it an agreement or a treaty? It's it's just an agreement, right? That the two countries mm. have between each other. And, uh, and, and then that's going to basically take care of all of those problems. I mean, I, I think it's, it, it's good. I would like to hear your response to this very uh, odd way of, of dealing with uh, the issue. I have no idea. I'm having a, a, oh, some weird technical difficulties on my end. So I apologize for the, the, some of the weird things that are going on. Well, you know, in the, in the, the Hicks case, um, you know, he had been detained for a substantial period of time and tortured um, at Guantanamo Bay. And um, there were a group of campaigners. Um, the it was it was weighing on the federal election. And of course, um, the prime minister of the day, John Howard, actually, um, you know, they cut a deal basically with the United States uh, to get um, uh, to transfer um, David Hicks back out of Guantanamo, um, but he was incarcerated when he arrived on Australian soil uh, and wasn't released until after the federal election. You know, it's it's so you don't have this, <laughs> this uh, person of interest um, landing on your soil that could blow your federal election apart, you know, so to keep him quiet, they, he, you know, he was put away until well after the election. Um, and, and, you know, I don't think... Uh, Assange's representatives um, are very smart. They understand the the, the alliance. Um, they understand the loyalty that um, Australia has to the United States, um, and they understand, you know, Australia's fear of upsetting the U.S. and their fear of abandonment, you know, in relation to the U.S. Um, and I think they themselves have said that all they're trying to do is create that political landscape um, whereby they can facilitate the government doing the right thing. Um, so they can't come out and publicly criticise the Australian government. Uh, they can only ask them for help, continue to ask them for help. Um, and, um, of course, the, as we approach the federal election, uh, the Australian government is going to get some heat because the Assange case is rolling on. You know, we, we will have the judgment in December maybe um, on the appeal um, we've got a cross-party uh, group of politicians who are very vocal about the mistreatment of Assange. Uh, we've got the alternative government, the Labor Party, who certainly passed a resolution here um, supporting Assange and, and, and basically saying that the party's position was to draw a line under it. But, you know, it's different, different when, when parties are elected, whether they will 
it, whether they will s stick to to their word. But there is a lot of there is a groundswell of support for for uh, Assange now. I mean, it, that hasn't always been the case. I think there are a lot of journalists in this country who sort of made up their minds a long time ago about their thoughts about Assange. Um, I think sometimes um, a lot of uh, journalists who try and sink their teeth into the case, you know, don't don't want to deal with the the, the fallout from from um, running pieces uh, about about him, which often often comes. Um, so, but you know, there there is a there is a groundswell. I think Assange's team has done um, some great uh, public relations work to really try and strip away um, the, the really the lies that have been told about Assange and his case for, for a very long time. Um, and so it's, and, and now the Australian government can no longer hide under this due process, the, the, the um, you know, procedural fairness argument when people can see now that, you know, that that is, that's not, that's not even a consideration in the Assange case. Due process went out the door a long time ago mm -hmm. um, and they can see it for mm -hmm. what it is. Um, and so uh, I think we'll see some changes on the horizon. I don't think, Assange is a very smart man. He knows, um, he knows when he would, he, where, which countries he would be safe in. Uh, and, um, you know, the other thing about the, the FOI material is is that every time a country offers asylum to Assange, you know, it excites our government. You know, they they scramble, um, you know, issue alerts and, um, you know, because what can they say? You know, he's an Australian citizen and we do nothing. And mm. countries all around the world are coming forward offering asylum. So, of course, it's embarrassing um, and sends them into a, a bit of a head spin. So... Um, the, the government's consecutive governments, the position that they've held in relation to the Assange case are just no longer tenable. They'll be no longer tenable. Uh, and, and at some point, the material that, that we've managed to put together over many, many years will be used uh, in a case against our government. I have no doubt about that, about their duty of care to this Australian citizen. Um, and, um, you know, reputations, personal reputations won't be won't be spared. And of course, we've got a previous foreign minister, Bob Carr, who was very hostile towards Assange when he was um, foreign minister. Uh, and now he's Assange's sort of number one advocate. You know, he's always on the front foot um, saying that our government should be doing more. They've got the leverage. They should be picking up the phone. Um, and he can't understand um, why um, the, foreign, the current foreign minister hasn't got it in her uh, to, to make that call. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we could start winding down the conversation. I will give you an, uh, some opportunity to share any final comments, especially you, Kip. But I just want to make sure people are also aware of this excellent um, chart that you put together that I found very useful for, uh, for, for when I do my, my streaming because uh, it's just, you know, it's it, it, it's it's very handy. Um, one second here, it'll be. Is this is this the right one? No, this is not. This is the one. Um, yeah. So uh, this is something that that shows the punishment by process that Assange has been going through in uh, his case, and as as is shown here at the different uh, at the different levels, um, you know, I can I can scroll up. You know, we are here with the U.S. appealing to the High Court. Uh, we're also here um, specifically because the judge ordered the discharge. Um, this is this is where we are at. Uh, we are waiting for the High Court of Justice to give us some kind of indication um, that they have a ruling. Um, we we actually don't know uh, unless you have heard something different, Kelly, when they're going to rule. We, I mean, we, so we're in the both, we're both in the same positions waiting to hear from this high court, which I'll just point out, uh, the district court did give us a timeline. They said that they would tell us on January 4th of this year that, uh, they, that they're, the, the ruling, the ruling will be presented by, um, judge Baretzer and that happened. And then with the, in the case of this high court, we got no indication of, of when they would specifically rule. It's left very open-ended. 
and it was you know you could you could believe that it's going to be december you could you could also believe it's not going to be till next year that we get any kind of decision which is not good for Julian, who is uh, sitting in Belmarsh and uh, should have been out on bail at minimum, but the the judge at the district court level basically did this favor for the U.S. government, you know, in in tandem with her ruling against the U.S. government, she then turns around two days later says that they have a right to keep him in jail, essentially, while they are pursuing their appeal, which seemed rather absurd. So, um, so, but that this, this, you know, this gives you all a sense as you look at this chart that there are a lot of uh, phases in this still uh, before we even see the, 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 the moment coming where Julian Assange could potentially be put on a plane and brought to the United States. There are, no, there are a number of years that we can expect to unfold if this remains on track before he's even brought here and and begins to go through the pretrial phases in the United States. So for both of you, um, anything you'd like to say as as we conclude? I mean, I, I mean, I, I think this is this just goes back to what Stratfor wrote, um, which you know, funnily enough, WikiLeaks revealed um, in in two thousand eleven. Uh, you know, the, the, their suggestion was, you know, uh, pile on and move him from country to country to face various charges for the next 25 years. And this is what we're seeing now. Yeah, if uh, the, the US has made abundantly clear that if uh, Julian is successful, they'll just appeal again and they'll file new charges and it'll just go on and on and on. Um, you know, if it, uh, you know, if Julian can appeal, if the US is successful, I was speaking to uh, people at the the hearings in London in kind of February, March, twenty twenty, um, who were attached to Julian's legal team, and they were saying that the you know the prosecution strategy is just to you know keep you know just keep him in this limbo for you know the next 10, 20 years. Um, it, again, it's really frightening. Whenever I've written about this case, I kind of felt that I'm, you know, either writing my own um, uh, obituary or death warrant. Uh, you know, the, I, I, and I, it would be entirely unsurprising to me if there had been, if there, you know, hadn't been high level discussions between London and Washington about you know whose soil he dies on. Um, I, I think you know a, a, a ruling which. You, legitimizes the US case while keeping in the UK is absolute you know gold dust to the Biden administration because it keeps him it keeps Julian you know in a state of you know permanent psychological and physical torture while um, on you you know in the UK while also um, you know you know preventing him from being dispatched to the US where he'll no doubt be subject to the most draconian horrific conditions imaginable and you know the, the likelihood of his death is greatly increased yeah and um, I would only add that that particular chart um, uh, was I wish I could take the credit for it but it was within uh, FOI material um, that was produced um, following request for information around um, um, documents produced at the time um, Baretza handed down her judgment. And, of course, some mm. sort of underpaid DFAT official has had to sit down and work out exactly where this is, you know, what's in store, what's ahead. Um, and, I mean, that is just alarming in and of itself because they can see from <laughs> their internal document that it's endless. You know, this is a, an endless process. Um, and you combine that with their knowledge of... Uh, um, uh, of of a man who uh, is approaching a, a, a yet another Christmas away from his family, who's who is in extreme distress. Um, you know, it's 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 appalling uh, and inexcusable. And so, um, you know, the fact that that our government, you know, has tracked it um, is um, and 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 sort of strategized about um, you know. What, what's ahead with this case is, you know, you know, what can you say? It's just, it's just inexcusable. Right, and I mean, I'll just say that there are are men that are known to have been brought by the United States to Guantanamo Bay military pre- prison, who, you know, when they were brought there, 
they had just given birth to children and they were away and, and missed them growing up. You know, they came back home and their kids were teenagers or even worse, they had mm. gone off to be uh, adults. And uh, when they were freed, they were meeting their teenage sons or daughters or their adult sons or daughters for the first time. And it truly is. It does seem like that's the predicament in which Assange finds himself. That that the that, that both Gabe Gabriel and Max, his his two boys, possibly will will not see him out of a jail cell or prison cell um, before they're teenagers. Maybe at this rate, just because if you judge what is unfolding and how they're mm. they're really, you know, without Australia intervening. Um, without the Biden administration, you know, first and foremost, I think we have to create uh, like a tree kind of and say the, the who has the most responsibility to drop these charges and drop this case against Assange, it's the U.S. Because the U.S. first and foremost is at fault here in targeting Julian Assange. Mm -hmm. But then next is in responsibility is the U.K. and uh, Australia and especially Australia, because he's an Australian citizen, right? So they are the ones that should be uh, doing more. Um, and then obviously, there's not a whole lot that Ecuador can do, having revoked citizenship and everything. They've sort of absolved their hands of any responsibility. But there is there is some role, there, there is some things that need to be remembered about them and, and, and how they basically ditched someone that they had granted political asylum to and uh and and now he is in a jail cell and being deprived of his human rights mm. uh so and, and that's exactly yeah. right and i think this federal election uh kevin is really you know the the last chance saloon because um at, um the federal government um has to be made to feel that they they have no choice but to act um, because we don't have another federal election for several years, you know, mm. um, and it, it's, Assange is already in a difficult state, um, and you know Stella and has shown a, a enormous courage in the face of all of that as she's watched the man she loves, um, you mm. know, diminish. Um, so um, you know this is really it for your listeners. Uh, the Australian government holds the key. Um, to to getting Assange out of out of that prison, putting an end to it. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think yes. If the U.S. government isn't going to drop charges, then Australia needs to come in and claim ownership over this person. I mean, if the U.S. is willing to say we could do a prisoner transfer, then Australia can also say very clearly we do not think he committed crimes that are worthy mm -hmm. of imprisonment, and we would like him to be able to come back home and live in our country. Um, and so that's that's really what we need. So it was good to talk to both of you. Um, before you go, I'm gonna put um, both of the sites up on here just so people can can uh, support your work and follow you. Uh, you know, so first off, we've been talking about this article from Kit that was done at the Gray Zone. I'll just scroll up so you can all see. Um, this is the this is a headline. It was published under New Files, Exposed Australian Government's Betrayal of Julian Assange in Detail, His Prison, Torment, uh, you know, Grey Zone, one of the sites has been supporting um, important coverage of Julian Assange's case at, uh, you know, at, at just about every phase since, since he was expelled from the Ecuador embassy, uh, really exploring the connections between uh, this case and the U.S. government's policies in general toward Latin America um, and other parts of the world. So um, good work, Kit. Thank you for that. And then, of course, um, thank Pleasure. you. Thank you, Kelly, for uh, your Pleasure. your continued work. I mean, I think it's fair to put you in league with uh, Stefania Marizzi, who uh, you know, you're both doing the, the thankless job of trying to get bureaucrats to cough up documents to you yeah. so that uh, you can, uh, you know, so that we can all know the truth of what's happening. So this is, this is your site um, and, and people can go to kellytranter.com mm. and, and find these records, find uh, these documents. And of course you're on 
Twitter and Kit, you're on Twitter as well. So both of you, mm. uh, we can follow you and uh, stay up to date on the, the, the work that you're doing on this. Uh, but uh, with that, uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone for tuning in to this broadcast. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and just for everyone who's following my work, just remind everyone that this is where you can subscribe to get continued updates on um, Assange's case as, as well as coverage of whistleblower stories that are possibly entirely unrelated to the topic that we had today, but still within the realm of being important. Um, and with that, um, I thank you all for watching and uh, we'll see you around. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers, Kevin. Kevin. Cheers.